Hey everyone, it is Thursday morning. That means we are doing our expert series, uh, 7 a.m. California time. And that means we are bringing back Jonathan Twomley to show. How you doing, Jonathan? I'm great. Thanks, Michael. How are you? I'm doing very well. So uh, we got kind of three subjects to talk about today. I know you and I are kind of the old sages for lots of people out there because we've been doing this so long. Uh, I know you wrote a post to your, uh, to your followers about what, what, what you could or should be doing in multifamily. Uh, I found it odd coincidence or odd that we, I did the same thing for single family. And then I think we'd be remiss if we didn't, you know, step back and once again, talk about what we see uh, that could possibly happen here in the very near future, just from an economic perspective. So uh, how's that sound? Yeah, it sounds great. That sounds like a good agenda for the, for today's show. Excellent. So uh, why don't you start, uh, you know, multifamily is something you and I both personally, we sold assets. Uh, mm -hmm. Because we felt we were at the peak of the market, we stashed cash, uh, which I think you know should should sh you know should show people that you know what we do what we say and and we're prepared for something like this. But you know, not everybody did. So uh, I'm curious what what your long list of thoughts about multifamily were in in today's environment. Yeah, well, I don't know if it's really such a long list, but okay. uh, but I think that there are some things that you should be doing right now let's just say you own rental properties at the moment and and, and particularly uh if you are uh, syndicating deals right mm -hmm. so you have investors in your deals i think you should be right now very very and let's just take a step back for just a second and say i don't really care and neither should you about your own personal opinion about whether coronavirus is overblown, whether people are going to die or not, because mm -hmm. none of that really matters because the reality is that the precautionary measures that are being taken and whether you think they're justified or not, they're being taken and it's going yes. to have an economic impact. So that's the context. Okay. So we don't need to debate about whether this is a real thing or not. The economic consequences are real. And in that, in that, in that context, here's what I think that you should be doing. You have to be prepared for the ultimate consequences of this thing being that your delinquency is going to go up mm -hmm. and your bad debt and potentially your uh your your vacancy and evictions even though you may not want to pursue evictions quite yet i mean you might decide as a business matter that you want to give people some slack your cash is going to be impacted and so what you should be doing is basically marshalling cash now you should not be making any more than your absolute minimum required distributions to your investors you should also do the client service of telling them why you're only giving them the minimum unless it's always your policy i think that's a good frankly the way i run my deals i always pay them out the minimum until the end of the year and then give them a big lump sum at the end just because i think it's prudent to hold on to cash mm -hmm. but uh, you, if you're not already doing that, you should be doing that. If you're kind of skirting the line with your preferred returns, you may even want to think about paying a little bit less than your PREF and hopefully you'll just make it up at the end of the year and it won't make a difference, but you, you're going to want to have to, you're going to want to be marshalling cash. You, you don't, you also don't want to be doing anything unnecessary on your property to involve spending money. So you want to be judicious about what you're spending money on, right? So if you can look for ways to save money, to put a patch on something rather than replacing it, uh, all these sort of things for the next couple of months, just to make sure that you have enough cash on hand so that if you do see a spike in your delinquency, you're not gonna get in trouble with your lender, right? Now, you may be in a kind of unfortunate situation where you're gonna to have to make somebody mad. Mm -hmm. Better to make your investors mad than to make your, your lender mad because your investors can't really do much to you uh, other than be mad at you. And if, and if by the end, if this all blows over and you pay them the cash later, by the end of the year, no one's going to even remember. But if, you do, if you're in a situation where you're not generating enough cash to make you your, you know, your DSCR requirements, your debt service coverage in your ratio, or, or God forbid, you're not actually able to pay your debt service, then you're going to be in a world of hurt. And I think that's the real danger here. I don't want to be alarmist, but I, I think what potentially could be coming down the pike is if you see a cascade of 
like the worst case scenario, and I think this is what you should be prepared for and hope it doesn't happen, right? Mm -hmm. But the worst case scenario of the situation is that uh, people are going to start getting laid off, mm -hmm. right? Corporate revenues are going to go down. All those junk bond holding, you know, the junk bond issuing corporations out there, which is about like, you know, half of them right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. uh, many of those companies could start defaulting on their debt mm -hmm. or getting into a situation where they have to make more layoffs in order to meet their debt service. And that's kind of like the downward spiral that we get into. Like the layoffs start, it, it reduces revenues, it causes more layoffs, that reduces revenues, causes more layoffs. That's, a, that's like a traditional recession scenario, right? That's yep. what happens in a recession. So if this thing triggers that kind of dynamic, then you as a landlord are going to have to get ready for this situation. And here's the other thing, I know, there's a lot of people out there who believe, and you and I, Michael, have talked about this, that you know, C properties will do well in a recession. <laughs> Even if that may be true in your particular market, here's the thing. It's not going to happen that fast. This is, a, this is kind of like a long run. You know, the, if there is a filtering down process, that is going to take place over many months. Your, crisis, your cash crisis could be acute. Right, so you may have one or two months or three months before that filtering down process happens, and that's enough to put you in a default situation with your lender. Mm -hmm. So, uh, fr frankly, I don't believe in the filtering down idea. I don't think there's any evidence for it. But even yeah. if you believe it, even if, or even, and even if you could show it to me, like in your market, this is what happens every time. Mm -hmm. I, I'd be willing to bet dollars to donuts that it does. It's not an instantaneous thing. You're not going to start seeing your tenants leaving or, or not paying in your property. And then suddenly, like, you get this flood of people coming from, your, from B properties in your neighborhood mm -hmm. to, to, fill, to instantly fill up the gap. I mean, independently of the fact that, like, you know, you, you may st you're going to have to turn units, right, which is yeah. a big cost, right? Yes. People forget about it. They think, oh, well, vacancy will be fine. You've got that probably at the minimum, you know, month of vacancy plus your turn cost is going to be more or less a month of rent. Yeah. So you have to be figuring out that, that yeah. you have to make that assumption, yeah, right? People, so, yeah, people that say that C-class properties do better in a recession, A, have never lived through it, uh, which I have, and they're only telling you a half truth. Was my occupancy in my C-class properties highest or near, you know, tied the highest it ever was? Yeah, but you just hit the magic words is it's not instantaneous. A paycheck to paycheck C class tenant doesn't leave on Monday and a B class tenant move in on Tuesday. It yeah. doesn't happen like that. And oh, by the way, you typically have a, at least a one month of non-payment because that's what people do. And then they, or they, you know, pull a U-Haul up at night and just leave. I mean, this, in owning C class apartments in a downturn, it hurts just as much as B and A class. And yeah. Turns kill you. I have, I have the tax returns to prove it. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, the turns, we had a terrible situation. And, and mind you, this is in a strong economy, right? Terrible situation at a C property where we were having a lot of evictions. We couldn't figure out why. It took us a long time to figure out why this is happening. It ultimately turned out to be that the, uh, the vendor who did the, um, the, the credit checks, right? Who was, who, you know, that the software that, we use to, to analyze oh, the no. credit worthiness of tenants was set wrong by the vendor. Oh. So, the, so the criteria was set for, for subsidized property, right. not market rate property. So people were getting approved who couldn't pay the rent. And it took us a long time to figure out why this was happening. But if, so maybe that's not going to happen if you, if, you've probably, if you have properly, you know, if you're properly bringing the right people in the first place. Nevertheless, what killed us was the turns, yeah. right? The turn cost Real money. was just- It's cash. Because, so, you know, we're missing, you know, someone comes in, they pay a few months of rent, then they, they, they miss a month's rent. Of course, they're saying, you know, give me time, give me time, give me time. You know, if you've got a manager who's a softy, then they, you, you, they might get a couple of months of free rent before an eviction is filed. Mm -hmm. Then you've got when they when you've, you've got the eviction costs, and then you finally got the turn costs when they get out. And you know, chances are, if they're not paying rent, they're also probably not taking that great care of your apartment. 
So it's going to be a hard turn. And, mm -hmm. uh, and this is what can happen. So if you have, if you have like, you know, th this is one reason why I'm very glad that I sold my properties in Spartanburg, South Carolina last year, because it's a, it's a manufacturing city. <laughs> it's a, in, specifically, it's an automobile manufacturing city. Mm. And all the automobile industry is one of the hardest hit in terms of supply chain issues from China. Yeah. So even if there's still demand for cars, people are going to get furloughed because they can't make any cars unless they have a big stockpile of, of parts on hand, which they don't with just in time manufacturing anymore. Right. So they're getting those parts like as they need them because they don't want the inventory co inventory cost. Right. So it's so this is, you know, I expect that if this goes on for very much longer, you're going to start seeing furloughs, not to mention the fact that the, on the demand side, things will definitely soften because anytime a crisis like this hits, the first thing people do is say, you know what, maybe I'm just going to hold off on buying that new car yep. for a couple of months. Yep. Right. Unless they absolutely, unless they, you know, their car was totaled and they need one. Right. But then maybe, the, you know, the, here's the filtering down. And then, then maybe they're not going to be buying the BMW that mm -hmm. was built in South Carolina. They're going to be buying, you know, the Volkswagen that was built in Tennessee instead. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, if you are in Tennessee, that's great. But if your properties in South Carolina, not so good. Um, but, you know, Boeing just had a whole, Boeing, oh. I don't know if you guys saw this, Boeing just had a, yeah. basically had a whole bunch of its orders canceled, right? So, because no one's flying right now and the yeah. airlines are all freaking out. Yeah. So, and even if, even if people start flying again, they're not going to be buying any new planes anytime soon. They're going to wait until this thing really sorts itself out. So, Cause that's, a, you know, that those are, those planes cost what tens of millions of dollars, right? Yeah. So yeah. Um, maybe more, I don't even know, maybe hundreds of millions. Hundreds of, of millions. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. So yeah. This, this, so this is serious. So, so get your cash, you know, get your cash situation in hand so that you can ride this out. That's, that's, Thing number one, like that's your mm -hmm. first priority. Yep. Thing number two is if you were in a situation where you are able to refinance, then think about refinancing because interest rates are plummeting. It, it, you know, they've already dropped 50 basis points. It looks like they're going to drop another 50 or more. I bet you it's so, a full point. I mean, you know, people are saying that they're saying we're going straight to zero, yep. right? And even though I think the economic impact of that is probably going to be negligible because this isn't a demand side issue, right? right. People aren't going to suddenly, it's like maybe I even mentioned this last week, but somebody was joking around with somebody on Facebook, you know, about whether like how exactly how much of an interest rate cut would it take for me to decide to put my children's health in danger? You know, like <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, yeah. 50 basis points, no, but a full point, yeah, I think, you know, I'm going to Disneyland because of that, right? So yeah. th this isn't going to make a difference in terms of uh, stimulating the economy, but it will make a huge difference for you if you're able to refinance. Yes. Uh, and, and the situation where you're able to refinance is, you know, if you've got a small multifamily that still qualifies as a, as a res you know, personal residence, mm -hmm. then you can just go refinance at will. Yep. If you're in commercial multifamily land, so five units or more, There'll be more restrictions. You'll have some prepayment penalties, but you should run the numbers and see whether it makes sense. It may well, the interest rates have come down so much that it may well make sense for you to, uh, to refinance and just eat the penalties. Yeah. So you should look at that, and especially if you're coming towards the end of your, your term anyway, maybe you've got a year or two left uh, before. I mean, just your penalties are not going to be that high. Just eat it. Mm -hmm. and, and refi because you know, I think these, this is a good time to do it. So that's, that's my advice if you're owning. Mm -hmm. If you're renting, I mean, not if you're, if you're renting, if you are um, looking to buy, right? If you're trying to break in, uh, I don't think that it's yet the time to buy. I think it's gonna be, the prices are gonna be sticky on the way down. I think it's gonna take more than, just real estate just moves so much more slowly than the stock market mm -hmm. that, it, we're not going to see the, the effect of this. We may never see the effect of this if this is short lived, but even if it is, even if it really does turn into a full blown recession, it's, it's going to take a while for that to kind of filter through the system mm -hmm. before sellers start to get realistic. You know, what you'll see for a while is, is properties not trading because the sellers are asking more than 
the buyers feel comfortable paying Mm -hmm. because the buyers will get skittish, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And eventually you'll see the sellers capitulate and start lowering their prices, but that will, that process will take a while. But, and what will drive that is what we talked about before. If you start seeing uh, NOI declining, right? That, you know, even if cap rates stay the same, if NOI declines, then values will come down. Yeah. Right. So, and, and there'll be a buying opportunity. Uh, so that, so just be patient. Now is the time to really be studying the markets and following the deals and learning how to do multifamily deals and talking to investors and kind of telling them about the potential opportunity that's ahead yeah. uh, so that they don't get scared, but they're actually ready to jump in when the time is right. So yeah. that's uh, that, that's my advice. What, so, what are you thinking and saying? Yeah, so single family homes is, is, is similar to that, but um, you know, I think we actually have opportunities um, that are kind of more in your face. So if we talk about single family homes, the hardest thing to do is find a motivated seller, right? Historically speaking, right? Because you have in single family homes are really residential, right? So homes to fourplexes. You have potentially two buyers. You have the owner occupant buyer, and then you have the investment buyer. The investor wants a deal, right? They want a deal, they have minimum targets, blah, 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 more down payment, all that stuff. Investors are always looking for a deal. Owner occupants make an emotional decision most of the time. They can come in for less money, so they can frankly overpay. Mm -hmm. What I think is going to happen, and I think it's gonna happen starting in March, but big time in April, is the owner occupant buyer, and oh, by the way, seller, are going to choose to delay decisions. Now, why is that important? Well, first off, sellers, right? If you were looking to sell your home because you wanted to upgrade or move or blah, 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 the last thing you are gonna do is hold an open house and have strangers come through and touch your stuff, right? Just not gonna happen. If you don't have to sell, you're not gonna list. So there goes a whole whack of inventory. Then what's gonna happen is buyers who are typically owner occupant buyers are going to go, you know what? We're going to sit tight. We're not going to make, not, not only we're we not going to make the new autom- automobile decision, but we're going to sit tight for three or four months because we're nervous or our friend lost their job or our friend was furloughed or whatever. And oh, by the way, if you're renting and you're just about to become an owner occupant buyer for the first time, you're going to keep renting, right? So there goes a whole whack of buyers. But what does that leave? That leaves motivated sellers because sometimes you got to sell. And we saw this in 2010 when 75 or 78% of the transactions were foreclosures or short sales. That means 22% were still normal sales, right? They didn't have financial distress. Most of those people had to sell, divorce, death, job movement, whatever it is. And it is going to become extremely easy. I bought 50, 48 properties in 2010 and 11 out of the multiple listing service who had big, bold letters saying, must sell, any offer considered, got to go to Texas, whatever it was. And that's just going to happen. So if you're in the residential space, uh, pretty much like you said with multifamilies, you need to spend the time learning your market right now, like March. Learn your market, learn your asset type, learn where you want to go because motivated sellers are about to be easy to spot probably April to August. And then this window will close because I am under the belief that we will get through this. American economy is strong. We're, you know, I'm, I'm a positive thinker. So you're going to have an April to August where motivated sellers are waving their hands at you. And I've done it. You can offer 40% under list price. And you know what? You get a counter in a hot market. Like we just left, you put a 40% offer. Your agent won't write the offer. So I am ecstatic about what's coming. And then the other things are, are out there, right? If you have residential uh, property, go back and refi. But here's, here's another fact. I've already had people try to do that and the rates are rising. Hmm. 469% increase in refinances week to week. Yeah, I saw that. Banks yeah. don't have capacity. So, you know, don't be in a rush, right? Don't be silly. But yeah, go ahead and refinance the debt. Um, because that they will work through this. Residential financing is, is generally speaking easy. And oh, by the way, much better than it was in 2008, right? These are like real loans. So 
Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm pretty excited. I do think this is going to be messy and sloppy. I think people are going to do what people do when they're afraid. And that means conserve, not list. Don't do this. Don't do that. But what that means is I'm going to be able to look online on Realtor.com or Zillow or Redfin and go, oh, motivated seller. Oh, motivated seller. Oh, motivated seller. And I'm, I'm, going to, I'm convinced I will buy more property this year uh, than I did in 18 and 19. Uh, I will probably leverage more private money because people are not going to get anything in the banks, just like I did in 2010. Even if unemployment doubles and it goes from three and a half to seven, that still means 93% of the people are getting paychecks and want to do something with their cash. So I'm frankly ecstatic about what's coming. It feels, it, I, when I say that, I feel bad saying it because I know there's a lot of harm and I'm a good person and all of that. But again, if we're talking about the business of investing in residential properties, I'm ecstatic. But don't gamble. Spend March, you know, staying home and learning your market and figuring it out and then get ready to write some, some offers. So that, that's, that's what I see in single families. Yeah. I mean, sloppy and messy is when money is made, yes. right? I mean, that's, that's when the money is made in, in real estate. It's not, it's not made after you've been watching people, <laughs> you know, do it for 10 years and you've been sitting on the sidelines and you're seeing them take huge profits and you are getting fear of missing out. That's not when money is made. That's when the suckers get in and get hurt. Because, mm-hmm. but, you know, the, just think about that. If, if, Michael, if your scenario turns out to be correct, right, who are the people who are going to be most hurt in that scenario? The people who, just, who bought just before this happened, yep. right? Who, and, and typically those are the people who, like if you've been buying all along and you have one or two duds that you bought at the top, it's not, yeah. not going to kill you. No. But right. it's, it's the new investor who's, you know, all hot and bothered to get in. And also probably those people are the people who don't do their homework yes. because they're, they're convinced about how easy it is because they just look at other people and they see the money being made. They don't see the hard work that went into it. Mm-hmm. And those are the people who just, you know, those are the people you see in my Facebook group on the multifamily side anyway, like basically begging for deal. Like they're in yeah. the group begging begging to be sent deals. Yeah. And you do, I'll buy, I mean, literally without, they don't quite say it, but it's like, I will buy anything. Yeah. And they've convinced themselves that they, you know, it's all going to make money no matter what. Yeah. And when you see that kind of stuff in the marketplace, you know, that's, uh, that, that's when the real danger happens on the other and that, because everybody's feeling good. Yeah. On the other hand, you know, when everybody, when people start, like you said, pulling back and being scared and delaying, you know, decision making, that's when people really make money who are, yeah. you know, have the stomach to go against the crowd. And you know, basically the people who think about it this way, the people who make money in this business are the ones who have the stomach to go against the crowd if, all the time. Every if you're time. following the crowd, whether the crowd is saying things are great or the things where the crowd are saying things are terrible, if you're following the crowd, you are not going to make. A lot I, I, I'm so glad you said that because it didn't hit me until like three days ago that if you actually read my book, you, you see two critical moments in our investing career, my wife and I's, where we drastically went against the crowd and it was uncomfortable, right? Yeah. When we sold our houses, technically 1031 exchanged our houses to apartments, people were telling us we were stupid because houses never go down and blah, blah, blah. Well, we couldn't, we, our math said we couldn't buy that ninth house. So some is good, more is better. We, we survived. Yes, our net worth got hit just like everybody else, but our cash flow exploded. And then we went in, all in, in 2010. I borrowed my 401k. I got a loan on my car. I mean, all these things that were just unnatural uh, when everybody was scared. And there were just, I mean, I was buying stuff for land value. And Uh, I guess there's a third time. It's not really in the book because we just did it. It's when you and I started talking. I sold apartments. Um, We sold uh, about a third of our apartments units and moved them into houses. So we have technically less units, but man, we are positioned awesome for this thing coming up because, you know, we we just got rid of C-class properties that, yes, they cash flowed, but man, I'm sure glad I don't have those upcoming capital expenditures and and all those things. So, um, you know, I have, uh, you know, now have a track record of three times going against the grain and I'm excited about what's coming. So uh, yeah, the, the, the people that just follow masses are, are going to get crushed. And two more things on single family. I can, can, I can 
fairly confidently say two groups of residential buyers are going to get crushed. Hmm. One is if you're flipping homes above the median, right? If you've enamored yourself because the last 10 years have been easy and you're flipping $2 million homes in the Bay Area or, or 500K homes in Fresno, good luck. You're going to go broke. Your debt service is going to crush you. You have no alternatives. You have no plan Bs. There's not, not another option. You are going broke. And then the California investor who says, oh, I can buy a house in Cleveland, just picking Cleveland randomly mm -hmm. uh, for 40K because it's cheap. You didn't do your freaking homework. You know, uh, it, the unemployment rate in Cleveland has been the best it's ever been. Right? What happens if manufacturing and demand and blah, 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 blah. Oh my God, they're going to get slaughtered. So um, you need to do your homework um, and learn your market and learn your market. Don't gamble. Don't, don't just do it because somebody else did it. That just, it's just dumb. Okay, so I want to, let's make this a live coaching session because I want to, I'm dying to ask you a question because it's something okay. I've been thinking about for a long time. So I, now obviously my single family is not my, zone mm -hmm. of expertise. Mm -hmm. But I've been thinking for a long time, I really like upstate New York as a place to vacation. We go okay. every year. There's mm -hmm. certain areas like near Lake Ontario and what have you. They're good, you know, sort of good vacation areas to, to go to. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff coming out on the market yeah, in upstate New so. York because of, you know, the population is declining up there. Mm -hmm. When people are leaving the area, they're moving south to warmer weather, what have you, lower taxes. Yep. And there's a lot of stuff coming up in the market. The, the, the area definitely is in population decline. And I would, as a multifamily investor, it's one of the first things that I, probably the very first thing I look at, if someone sends me a deal and I don't know what the market, I've never heard of the market before, yeah. the very first thing I do is look up the census data and see if it's growing or shrinking. Ah, okay. If it's shrinking, I won't, I won't touch it. Mm. Uh, if, it's, if it's growing, then I'll, I'll look at it. I mean, I've got other parameters too, but that's sort of like, you know, don't even show me a deal if the market's not growing. Okay. Um, but for single family, I'm very curious about like, what would be your advice if I, cause you know, I would not obviously be living in the place I would want to use it as a vacation home, but also as a rental, mm. you know, like a short term Airbnb kind of rental. Mm -hmm. What are the kinds of things that you would look at to kind of give yourself confidence in buying an asset in a market like with those characteristics where the population is going down. So it's really going to be, it's really going to be purely just a vacation rental. And you're going to have to understand like there's going to be a lot, probably a lot more vacation rentals coming on the market yeah. because of the population decline. People will be renting out houses that can't sell yeah. or there'll be other investors who are going to be going, Oh, look at these cheap houses. I'm going to buy them and rent them out. Uh, so what's, I, yeah, I'd what, hear your advice. Yeah, what I would tell you or anyone, because I get this question a lot, not only about vacation homes, but my primary residence, right? Um, those are emotional decisions because you will be using that thing some set of weeks a year, right? right. So there's some emotional EQ, all of that. Um, so that's, yeah, I, I have a thing in sales, right? People um, buy emotionally, but they justify it logically, right? Right. right? right. So you have an emotional attachment to the area. You probably like certain segments of the area. Like that's the emotional side. And then you're going to go and you're going to build a spreadsheet that logically justifies it. That's just how human beings react. So what I would tell you as a friend, which we are, is um, I like the idea. It's something you've always wanted to do. Rada, rada, you know, you've worked so hard, blah, blah, blah. But I would tell you to go find a great deal, right? I'm not talking a good deal. I mm -hmm. think you need to go find that motivated seller. Um, and you need to be willing, you know, if you're looking at like this segment of the market, maybe look at this segment. So you, you, the, the pie is bigger. And you need to buy a deal that's 30 or 40% under what you're, you know, what you think it is, because mm. you're lucky not to be in a rush, right? You could buy it this year or next year. Right. Uh, you just want to have it. So what I would be searching for is that one outlier, you know, hey, my mom lived there for 40 years. None of the kids want it. Um, you know, it hasn't been updated since 1968. We're going to give it to you for half off because you can write a check. You know, I, I would be looking for a situation that means you have a lot of downside protection. That's what I would be looking for. And what about this? This is another thing I've thought of. Like, it seems to me that the, the position of the property is especially important in a market like that, right? So it's got to have, it can't just be like, oh, well, it may, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe it, uh, on some level, like for people who just want to go there and stay there for a couple of weeks and rent a house, mm -hmm. like 
it doesn't have to be lakefront or whatever yeah. but but i mean it strikes me though that the the more kind of unique the property is in terms of like lakeside or lake views or uh -huh. whatever the yeah bad, now you see you're, you're you're well see now you're you're taking the emotional and the uh -huh. logical and you're trying to blend them together right yeah because now what you're what I heard you say, right, when I translated what you say is I'm going to overpay for Lakefront or Lake View or whatever, because I'm just guessing that stuff costs more. Yeah. I'm just guessing. I wasn't, I wasn't playing. I mean, I was wondering if it looks, if it makes more sense to try to find a deal. I would find a deal first. No, I, I yeah. wouldn't. I mean, I don't know the quantity, right? If there's thousands of Lake View and Lakefront homes, then yeah, of course. But I'm guessing it's 15% of the available homes. I, mm -hmm. I'm just blind ass guessing. But I mean, the, the pie would be too small, I think. Right. And you're going to have too many logical buyers saying, hey, if I get this, I can Airbnb it for an extra 20% or whatever, which is probably not going to be true in a market that's going to be inundated with options. It is going to be a low cost leader market. Um, mm. You know, so again, I would look for the deal, right? I'm guessing Lakefront and Lakeview has more bids. I think if you had a property that was just off Lakeview, like then you just put scooters or you, you, you give them, you know, easy access. And you get a 50% discount versus a 10, I think you're going to be, the numbers will just work better in my opinion. Makes sense. Yeah. All right, so cool. that, that's what I would think. So um, I think it would be remiss uh, right when we started uh, the S and P hit the circuit breakers again, it was down 7%. Uh, I haven't actually looked to see if it's down more. Uh, I think we're getting, I think we're getting pretty close to that fear, uh, which it feels bad to say, but we have to get there to get to the bottom. Uh, so I just, you know, I, I think we'd be remiss if we don't talk about what's going on in the stock market because everybody's looking. Well, listen, if that's, if, if that 7% has held up, then we're definitely in a bear market as defined by a 20% decline. From oh, there's the no question of bear right. markets here. No so question. how long it lasts, who knows, right? Mm -hmm. But I think, I think certainly the fear has hit uh, the stock market. You know, it, it, it obviously it displays itself a lot. The stock market is a lot more, uh, subject to emotions than the at least the commercial real estate market is just because it moves you know there's liquidity like yeah. you can always seconds you can almost always find somebody to take your trade mm -hmm. you know there's always there's almost always a buyer for every seller in the in the uh, in the stock market whereas it's not the case with real estate you know that mm -hmm. is a market that can grind to nothing mm -hmm. if things get bad but I, I it hasn't happened yet and I think you know, if, if we're, I'm just kind of guessing where you're going with this, if, if what the impact is of the declining stock market on the real estate market is, I think, I think there is going to initially be, I think there will be a pretty large segment of the investor class out there that will consider um, commercial real estate to be a safe asset. So there'll be some flight to safety. And I think also with declining interest rates, there'll be a lot of people who are saying like, oh, the, you know, now is a good time to buy because interest rates are, are falling. Mm -hmm. So I think in the short term, you may see even an, an uptick in commercial property sales mm -hmm. and prices. Yeah. Yeah. The issue, not, is, the issue then that goes back to the, what we were talking about before is if this then becomes a real recession as opposed to just a stock market correction, mm -hmm. then, yeah. then you've got, the dynamic starting to unravel. And I think so, th some of those people who rushed in at the top because mm. they thought it was safe are going to be the ones who, unless <coughs> they bought really well positioned properties and they went in with low leverage and they the really have a game plan uh, for dealing with the correction, unless yeah. they go in with that attitude. I mean, they, they go in with eyes wide open and say, I know I'm buying at the top, but, I, but given all my options out there in the world, this is the best option. And I'm going to plan for this the contingency of the of the underlying fundamentals getting worse like if you go in with that attitude you may be able to ride out what's coming but if you go into the attitude that like the fed's going to cut rates and they're going to cut rates more and that's going to be great for me uh no matter what like that's yeah. that's the that yeah. those people are going to have a surprise yeah i wasn't trying to lead the witness what i was thinking in this is um you know, I, we both believe this will pass and we will be stronger when this comes out of it. And, you know, all of those things, we both have said that we both believe that. Um, I know the only way to get there is you got to get to the bottom, right? Yeah. It's, and then that's a messy and hurtful and scary and fearful and it sucks. Uh, and lots of people are going to be hurt and there will be a capitulation day. And I think it's getting closer 
Uh, I'm really scared for tomorrow because who wants to be long the weekend? Oh my God. Um, you know, so I think we're getting close and I, you know, I, again, people listen, I am happy that we're getting close. If that makes any sense, because the only way we can get out of this is you have to hit bottom. It's just, this is how this things work. And, you know, uh, we got to get there. And the fact that the NBA um, canceled or postponed its season, the fact that Carnival Cruise Line just came out and said, we're taking a 60 day hiatus. Um, you know, all of these things have to happen folks uh, for the bottom to be put in and we can start healing ourselves. Um, so I'm encouraged. I don't know if it makes sense. I'm encouraged by all the bad news. I mean, we just got to get there. I mean, we just got to get there. So that's what I was thinking. Well, I think there's certainly been a lot of, hot air in the markets for a long time mm -hmm. and you know they it can't go on forever and the, and, and it's precisely these kinds of events hmm. that that lead to bubbles bursting you yeah. know it's not it's not that everybody one day wakes up and like you know i'm paying too much for stock and i think i should sell yeah. it's usually something causes them to uh, to start fearing not fearing being the last guy to sell that's what that's what happens right so Correct. because something happens something happens out, out you know out of the blue like this um, but it only but it's because the market was set up for a fall yeah right? if the market if everything was like really fairly priced and people weren't already in the back of their minds going mm -hmm. like that then yeah. you know this wouldn't have the same effect that it's having but it's precisely because people have been feeling for a while that market's overvalued. And, you know, even before this coronavirus hit, I was reading, you know, from a lot of more bearish investors who were saying, you know, look, the market's set up for a 50%, you know, correction, a, a, a real honest to goodness bear market, which we haven't seen in a while, but the, the, the conditions are ripe for it. Mm -hmm. All we need is a trigger. And here's now the trigger. Heck of a trigger, yeah. So um, when all is said and done, yes, I mean, Asset prices will be better priced. Uh, I, I just, I mean, I, I just, what I see though that is just a shame, like from societal perspective, is that we've been gorging on, on free money, or not free money, but low cost money for a long time. You know, all these corporations out there have taken all this cheap debt on not to invest in. To buy their, their stock. Just to buy their stock back, right? And all that's done, think about just the destruction in value that's taken place. So that's, you know, they've borrowed money to put it into, I guess you argue, they put it into their shareholders' pockets. And but if their shareholders just turned around and bought other stock, right, with the, with the money, there's, there's just been this basically like enormous destruction of, of wealth yep. for, for just for greed. Right? No, yeah. And well, greed or stupidity, let's be clear. It could be either. Yeah. But I mean, you know, they thought they can boost their stock prices, they boost their CEO bonuses because the stock prices are all tied, you know, Just the bonuses sad. are tied to the stock price. They, it, it ought, frankly, it ought to be illegal. It's self dealing, if you ask me. But like they're borrowing, they're using the company's money to borrow money and then buy back the shares to boost CEO pay. Yeah. You know, it's like, the, the shareholders ought to be, you know, I mean, they love it because their stock price is going up. But now you see what happens. Now they're just, now the, the debt, the debt goes, the, the, you know, the value goes away, but the debt's still there. It's just exactly. like, you can see this with, with rentals too, right? If you yeah. overpay, value goes down, cash flow may go down, the debt is still there, right? Yeah. So, uh, and, you know, instead of investing that money in, you know, production, investing it in, you know, new plant and equipment, investing in whatever that would still be there, like stuff that doesn't disappear because the stock price goes down. They just invested in stock. It's just like they might as well be buying air. Yeah. Right? Exactly. So, you know, it's, uh, th that's what I see as like the, the real tragedy of this cheap money stuff. I mean, I think yeah. it should have ended a long time ago. But, well, I have a sneaky suspicion that will be uh, addressed when we come out and clean ourselves off from this. At least I hope, knock on wood, people. Right. People do that, but we'll see. We'll see. So, Jonathan, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, gosh, I, I hope we have better news to talk about in a week. Uh, I, I think it's going to be, I'm unfortunately thinking it's going to still be pretty scary, but we will be there to help people get advice. If you want to ask Jonathan or I a question, leave a comment below in this video, and I will make sure Jonathan and I address it first thing next week.
Have a great day, Jonathan. Yeah, you too. See you next week, Michael. Yep.